Welcome to the History of the World podcast. My name is Chris Hasler. And you're listening to Volume 2, The Ancient World. This is Episode 2, The Akkadian Empire. Last time we established that cities started appearing in Mesopotamia, beginning with the emergence of Eridu, established during the 6th millennium BCE. This was during the Ubayid period of prehistoric Mesopotamia and saw the emergence of irrigation and canal building which led to the population of large stratified city-states through the success of their agriculture. The Ubayid period made way for the Uruk period around 4000 BCE, which saw the expansion of city-states and the broadening of trade networks. High populations of working class individuals kept the day-to-day running of the city-states in a somewhat collectivist fashion, ensuring that other city-states may not exploit its weaknesses. The Uruk period saw the emergence of the earliest forms of writing and in turn made way for the Gemdet Nazar period in around 3100 BCE where we can establish the success of the stratified way of life and the success of the earliest forms of bureaucracy linked to larger amounts of cuneiform documents discovered from these dates. This was followed by the early dynastic period in around 2900 BCE which saw the recognition of city-state monarchs and city-state deities and the subsequent growth of the temple complexes built within the cities. Pretty much all of this period is considered as Sumerian and references the Sumer culture of southern Mesopotamia. The Sumerians of the early dynastic period spoke their own Sumerian language and were tied together politically by the priest king of the city of Uma, namely Lugal Zagasi. As we found out last week, Lugal Zagasi ruled over Suma from the city of Uruk, in what historians refer to as the third dynasty of Uruk. However, there was an ethnically distinct group of people from the north of Mesopotamia who had their eye on their Sumerian neighbours in the south. The Akkadians. The Akkadians are named after the city of Akkad. It appears that the people of Akkad did not speak to each other in the same language as their Sumerian neighbours to the south. Some linguists believed that the language of the Akkadians was an early form of Semitic language. Apart from that, it is very difficult to actually pinpoint the origin of Akkadians. They were clearly distinct from the Sumerians and their capital city of Akkad has never been located. Akkad may have been founded by a young man by the name of Sharoukin. The man's name has come down to us in the modern age as Sargon. 
and he was the one to rise up in defiance of Lugal's Agassiz, who we mentioned before as the man who united the city-states of Suma. Lugal's Agassiz's influence reached Akkadian home territory, and Sargon did not appreciate this. Whether it be a personal mission of Sargon to destroy Lugal's Agassiz, or whether Sargon was hungry for power himself, he decided to take on Lugal's Agassiz and his army of troops, led by the leaders of the Sumerian city-states. As described in last week's podcast, Sargon would ultimately defeat Lugal's Agassiz and imprison him in the city of Nippur. There he would be publicly embarrassed and ultimately executed. Sargon and the Akkadians had conquered Suma and killed its ruler, taking the territory for themselves. Some historians cite this as the age of the first world empire, the Akkadian Empire. I would suggest that this comes down to whether you consider Lugal Zagassi's Sumerian realm to be an empire, with the argument against that being that Suma at the time was just a network of city-states. Why is it that Lugal Zagassi was not able to defend Suma? Firstly, we should look at what we believe the Sumerian armies looked like. We can get incredible information about this from the victory stills of Sumerian city-states battling against each other and the recovery of excavated artefacts dating to this period. Sumerian soldiers were professionals. They fought in phalanxes. A phalanx is a tightly packed group of soldiers. They would have been armed with long spears and equipped with copper helmets. These phalanxes would have had to have been very disciplined to be effective. So they must have been intensely trained by commanders. These commanders would have had their own chariots. These wheeled vehicles would have been pulled by onagers. Onagers are wild relatives of horses. So how on earth did the Akkadians defeat such a well-organised and battle-hardened professional army like the Sumerians? Sadly, we do not appear to have as much evidence of Akkadian warfare in the lead-up to the conflict, but we should be able to make some assumptions and pick up some pointers from what we do have. It would be fair to say that the Akkadians were just as battle-hardened as the Sumerians. They were well known for their campaigns into foreign territories and were successful. When Sargon the Great led the Akkadians southwards into Sumer, it has been suggested that his army was over 5,000 strong, which is considerable. Akkadians are also historically known for their archers and so it could have been reasonable to suggest that the presence of archers among the Akkadian armies may well have caused disarray among the phalanxes of the Sumerians. I would suggest that Lugal Zagassi underestimated the power of Sargon. Lugal Zagassi's army appears to have been a collaboration of armies from the city-states, whereas Sargon's could have been constructed as one single, mighty, cohesive unit. There are a number of reasons that the Akkadians could have defeated the Sumerians and it is likely to be a combination of factors. One thing that we can be sure of is that Sargon the Great and his Akkadian army were victorious. Well, this is pretty much where last week's story led us. Sargon had conquered Suma and all of its cities. He had destroyed the city's walls by creating breaches to enable Akkadians to venture in and out at will, policing the populations. The Sumerians didn't have to like it, they just had to accept it. 
their land had been invaded and conquered by foreigners speaking in a foreign language. Contemporary king lists do demonstrate within their names that the Akkadian culture was not something that just popped up during the 24th century BCE, but that the kings of Kish, a city-state to the north of Sumer for a few centuries, were Semitic, or Semites, whatever you prefer. So it was an established culture, as opposed to a new or immigrating one. The integration of a group of people speaking in a foreign language was quite tricky. Akkadians spoke in Akkadian and Sumerians spoke in Sumerian. The attitude of the Akkadians seems to be different. They seem to be more into monarchical power than temples and ziggurats. They would be more inclined to attack and conquer than trade and worship. The irony of this whole situation was that it took a much more secular style of a Sumerian king to attract an Akkadian invasion. There just isn't anything in the written record to suggest historic ethnic tensions between Akkadians and Sumerians. Most of the population would likely have had very little knowledge of the other culture. So when Lugal Zagasi, a much more command and conquer style of king, decided to expand his influence over Sumer from his base in Uruk, it does appear that he ultimately overreached himself when he ventured north to the city of Kish. The residents of Kish were clearly more associated to Akkadian culture and the Akkadian king Sargon decided that this was unacceptable and launched his invasion. It was late in Sargon's life that he launched the attack, which further supports the theory that this was a reaction rather than a harboured ambition. Sargon of Akkad In 1931, the British Assyriological archaeologist Dr Reginald Campbell Thompson was working near the ancient Assyrian city of Nineveh in the north of modern Iraq with his assistant Robert Hamilton when they uncovered a bronze cast human head undoubtedly chisel finished and typical of Akkadian workmanship and therefore attributed as such. It is believed to be the likeness of a king and as such it has been convenient to suggest that it is the head of Sargon of Akkad. The most famous of all Akkadian kings and the conqueror of Sumer, the reality is that it could have been any Akkadian king, but nonetheless the artefact is a breathtaking relic of Akkadian significance. As such, the head is closely associated with Sargon and could actually even be his likeness. We just don't know, but you will see this iconic head whenever you conduct an internet search related to Sargon. The first mention we have of Sargon in any contemporary texts is within the king lists. He is mentioned being the cupbearer of the king of Kish. Now this sounds like a bit of a rubbish job invoking visions of some poor spotty teenager being commanded to make drinks for everyone on request. But it is also described as a duty of great importance and to be given such responsibility would require you to be a trustworthy individual within the royal courts. As such we can confidently state that Sargon of Akkad was not a Sumerian. He would have spoken a different language, the language spoken in Kish, which would come to be regarded as Akkadian. Sargon of Akkad would have actually been Sharukin of Agada in the Akkadian language. Agada would have been the Akkadian name for the city of Akkad which 
as we mentioned, Sargon is attributed as being the founder of, but also, as previously mentioned, has never been discovered. Details of Sargon's life and reign are understandably sketchy, and as with all contemporary writings, it is open to some interpretation. Most king lists tell us that Sargon reigned over Akkad for around 55 years, from around the late 24th century BCE. The length of the reign is open for debate, as it is claimed that he actually founded the city of Akkad. Either way, we can feel confident that he reigned over the Akkadians from its capital city of Akkad, even if Akkad existed before Sargon. It may have been in the early 23rd century BCE that Sargon's Akkadian army was able to conquer Uruk, the capital of Sumer, and capture its king, Lugal Zagasi, who would ultimately be imprisoned and executed before the Akkadians would breach and take control of all other Sumerian cities yet to be defeated. The Akkadians obviously appreciated the way in which Sumerians recorded things with cuneiform writing and so decided to use it themselves to record their own Akkadian language too. This would create a sprachbund, which is a way of describing a convergence of two languages. So this means that modern scholars who can decipher cuneiform and translate the languages written can see the distinct differences between Sumerian language and Akkadian language. Much as we mentioned that Sargon's conquest of Sumeria may not have been a harboured ambition, it certainly appears that it was a welcome invitation that Sargon was more than up for the challenge for. Sargon is accredited with conquests west of the centre of Akkad as far as the Mediterranean Sea, where it is said that he symbolically washed his weapons to show that he had command of those lands up to the sea shore. It is said that he fought against the Hattians, who are believed to have been based in central Anatolia, which is a considerable distance north of the centre of Akkad. It is also believed that there was at least trade links and influence as far east as Elam and as far south as Magan. After his conquest, Sargon set about making political assertions on the Sumerians and installed his own daughter as a high priestess in the city of Ur. Her name was Enheduanna. Her position as high priestess was in honour of the Mesopotamian goddess of love, Inanna, whose Akkadian equivalent goddess was Ishtar. Sargon's regard for Ishtar was considerable and his daughter Enheduanna wrote a number of hymns for Inanna as a consequence. Some of these hymns have survived on clay tablets and so they come to us as the first literature for which we can attribute a known author. Enheduanna was the first poet. This is a small section of a hymnal prayer written by Enheduanna and dedicated to Inanna. The kingship of heaven has been seized by the woman at whose feet lies the floodland. That woman so exalted who has made me tremble together the city. Stay her, let her heart be soothed by me. I, Enheduanna, will offer supplications to her. My tears, like sweet drinks, will I proffer to the holy Inanna. I will greet her in peace. Let not 
Ashim Baba, be troubled. Luni Solar Calendars. The current Jewish year is AM five seven seven nine, with AM standing for Anno Mundi, or the year of the creation of the world. So therefore, it has been 5,778 years since the world was created, because AM1 was the year of emptiness, one year before creation. Adam and Eve were created on the first day of AM2. This would suggest that according to the Jewish calendar, the earth was created in around 3761 BCE. This would have been during the Uruk period of our Mesopotamian history. Strangely enough, this is also the same year that some of the cuneiform texts discovered state a man called Naram Sin proclaimed himself as God and Master of the Universe. It's fair to say that he appears to have gone into self-promotion in the highest way possible. Naram Sin is an Akkadian and what's more is that he is an Akkadian king and that he is the nephew of the poetic high priestess Enheduanna and the grandson of Sargon of Akkad. Therefore, we have a link between the earliest Semitic people of Akkad and the modern Semitic people of Israel. The year of 3761 BCE is not really accurate according to modern dating methods, however, but it is likely that the historical recording of years on ancient documents is questionable anyway. For example, the Sumerian king list states that the first king after the Great Flood, Jushur of Kish, reigned for 1,200 years, which is questionable in my very humble opinion. However, all of this may not all be completely unrelated as it is believed that the modern Jewish calendar can trace its roots right back to the Akkadian Empire and the way that they used to observe time with the use of a lunisolar calendar. They also appear to have pretty much the same name for the months of the year, so we could claim that the Akkadians are responsible for the first type of modern calendar. The main difference we see between the two calendars is the way that the year is referred to. So if in the modern world we refer to it by a number, the Akkadians would refer to it by an event. So an example would be the year that Naram Sin went to the cedar forest. Naram Sin It is important now that we investigate the chronology a little bit deeper and why we had people claiming to be the master of the universe. Sargon was quite elderly when he conquered Sumer. It could be considered as his last significant campaign. As we mentioned previously, Sargon understood that he now presided over foreigners in the Sumerians and set about making political decisions to consolidate the region, which in part involved using his family members to take up important political positions. One we have already mentioned was his daughter Enheduanna, who was installed as the high priestess of the goddess Inanna at the city of Or. After Sargon's passing, the responsibility of the empire went to one of his sons, Rimush, before passing to another of his sons, Manish Tushu. The reign of Rimush appears to have been tainted 
by the uprising of Sumerian rebellions, but he overcame them and managed Tushu's reign was relatively more controlled. Eventually, the monarchy would pass down to Manish Tushu's son and Sargon's grandson, Naram Sin. Naram Sin would rule for many years and was apparently a great commander who kept control over his empire for most of the reign, which was in the latter half of the 23rd century BCE. Naram Sin referred to himself as the master of the universe or the god of Akkad to try and give himself the most powerful sounding title that a mere mortal ever dare give himself. The Akkadian Empire was at its strongest under Naram Sin. Administrative documents began to be written in Akkadian instead of Sumerian and Akkadian influence was at its largest extent. Rebellions were kept under control. Successful military campaigns were celebrated and recorded pictorially on victory steels. Ultimately, the empire would pass into the hands of Naram Sin's son, Shah Kali Shari, and the tide would turn. Shah Kali Shari Naram Sin died in perhaps 2217 BCE and the throne of the empire was passed down to Shah Kali Shari. There really isn't a lot of information available to us about Shah Kali Shari, but what we do know is that his reign was an important one. Certainly we do know that the Akkadian Empire had at least since Shah Kali Shari's father's reign been subject to raids from the Guti people. So who were the Guti people? Well, the Guti, otherwise known as the Gutians, are peoples from Gutium. Gutium is the land to the direct northeast of Mesopotamia, along the Zagros Mountains, but to the north of Elam. The Guti were culturally distinct from both the Sumerians and the Akkadians, as there appears to be a linguistic distinction that doesn't relate too closely to anything else. We do know that they were undertaking raids on Naram Sin's Akkadian lands, and they were becoming more frequent during the reign of Naram Sin's son, Shah Kali Shari. It appears that Shah Kali Shari had to raise more taxes from the cities to fund the defence of the empire. However, the people of the Akkadian Empire, many of which had distinct Sumerian roots, were certainly not pleased with the pressures on their day-to-day lives of these taxes. Initially though, it appears that Shah Kali Shari had some kind of success, with one of the years of Shah Kali Shari's reign being named after he successfully captured a Guti king. However, the strain of funding the Akkadian army's defence started taking its toll on the population, with famine becoming a real threat. This would lead to internal instability of the empire, with Suma suffering from what has been described as a terrible drought. This would cause those vassal kings of the cities of Sumer to rebel against their Akkadian ruler, Shah Kali Shari. Collapse Before we start pointing the finger at Shah Kali Shari as the king who lost control of the Akkadian Empire, we should potentially go back to pointing our finger at something which we frequently point our finger at during the prehistoric volume of the History of the World podcast. Specifically, climate. During episode 23 about pre-dynastic Egypt, we referred to an aridification event called the 5.9 kilo year event in which humans had tried to make radical adjustments to their places of settlement and their way of life to survive the hotter and drier conditions. 
Well, it is possible that there is also a 4.2 kilo year event, which, as the name suggests, happened 4,200 years ago. This would have been during the Akkadian Empire and during the reign of Shah Kali Shari. There do appear to be culture shifts in other parts of the world which point towards an aridification event or a significant cultural shift at around the same time. In Egypt, it is believed that a climatic shift caused political collapse, so maybe Shah Kali Shari was the victim of a bit of bad luck. The people of the Sumerian cities within the Akkadian Empire would have suffered from major crop failures, drought and famine, leaving them vulnerable to external attacks and vulnerable to internal social instability. The drought would cause cities to rise up in defiance of their Akkadian rulers and in some cases cities would be completely abandoned. The heartland of the Akkadian Empire in northern Mesopotamia was affected too. Tel Leyland was an established Akkadian city going into this period. Tel Leyland can be found in the Al Hasaka Governorate of modern day Syria. Archaeological evidence from the site shows that no human activity took place for three centuries from around 2200 BCE, the time of the proposed 4.2 kilo year event. The drought would have undoubtedly led to similar pressures being exerted onto neighbouring populations, notably the Amorites to the west of the Akkadian Empire. Some Amorites would have been forced into Akkadian lands by the lack of resources, and as such they would have been brought into conflict with the Akkadian Empire, feeling the pressure of the drought from the east through the Guti and from within through the cities. It is often the Guti who are credited with the destruction of the city of Akkad. Such was the destruction that to this very day we have not been able to find this mysterious but very important city of northern Mesopotamia. Whether the successors of Shah Kali Shari had a city to rule from or not is uncertain. What is certain is that the Akkadian Empire had collapsed and that a period of unrest ensued. After Akkad Whether or not the Akkadian Empire completely collapsed after the apparent abandonment of Akkad is debatable. Certainly though, it does appear to have disintegrated over time. After the death of Shah Kali Shari, it appears that no one knew who was actually the king. Certainly, there are names on the Sumerian king list, but even the writer states that it is not actually clear. Part of the reason might be because the Sumerian cities were now under the influence of the Guti people, who appear to be much more nomadic than their Akkadian neighbours. So civilised and stratified society may have been too advanced for them, as it appeared that organised society within the villages may have been breaking down due to famine and drought. Many settlements had been abandoned for this reason, so it does appear that the Akkadian Empire became a comparatively lawless society. This is sometimes referred to as a Mesopotamian Dark Age, although it is fair to say that there are a number of periods during Mesopotamian history called a Dark Age, so we cannot label it exclusively as such. There is another name that scholars give to this period. Throughout the Akkadian period of Mesopotamia, it does appear that the neighbouring peoples were likely raiding the empire. We mentioned the Amorites from the west, but we can also recognise problems being created by the Hurrians from the north and the Elamites from the west. It is, however, the Gutians who gain the most credit 
for the destruction of the Akkadian Empire and as such we can refer to this apparent interregnum as a Gutian period. The Gutians appear to have had very little interest in establishing a stratified empire. They just seem to have wanted the spoils of battle victory. The cities of Mesopotamia had to rebuild their own fortunes, their own wealth and their own defences. In the south, they had to consolidate their irrigation channels. In the north, they had the luck of the rain to protect their agricultural industry. Surplus of agriculture would have been an essential trading tool for these rebuilt city-states. The city-states that flourished notably were Uruk, Ur and Lagash. Uruk is mentioned as the next major dynasty within the contemporary king lists. However, there does also appear to be mentions in other documents of a dynasty emerging in Lagash. Certainly, under the leadership of Gudia, Lagash enjoyed a resurgence with ambitious trade links developing and a cultural renaissance. However, after Gudia's lifetime, Lagash had passed its peak and the next city to start making waves was Uruk, but Sumer was still very much in the shadow of the Guti. It was a man called Utu Hengal from Uruk who led the Sumerian people into a revolt against their Gutian oppressors, and he did it well, successfully forcing the Guti out of Sumer and back towards the mountains where they had originally come from in order to cripple the Akkadians. Utu Hengal met his end in a very strange fashion. An accident occurred while he was inspecting a dam and he drowned. We know that he certainly left a daughter and we know that she married a man called Or Namu. And Or Namu is fundamental to the next period of Mesopotamian history. But that story is for the next podcast. Thank you ever so much for listening to this week's podcast. And also thank you to over 600 of you who listened to last week's podcast. Now that's the most we've ever had listened to a new podcast that's been brought out. So thank you ever so much. It's great to see that the podcast is increasing in popularity. Let me try and keep up all the hard work to keep them coming. Just a couple of new recommendations to mention that were posted on the Facebook page this week, so I'd like to mention them as a thank you to those who took the time and trouble to write them. Kim R. Hanoi has recommended History of the World podcast, says, Hello from Norway. I highly recommend this podcast. I found the podcast on Spotify after having searched for something exactly like this. Since discovering the podcast, I've listened through the entire volume one, the prehistoric world and I'm now looking forward to the very first episode of volume 2 early dynastic Mesopotamia that was released this weekend I listened to the podcast when driving back and forth to work enjoying the opportunity to learn and obtain more knowledge and not simply wasting my time in traffic I know exactly how that feels Uh, The podcast comes through as a solid piece of work. It is well structured and well put together with a clear goal to try and help you uh, to, to, sorry, I beg your pardon, a clear goal to help guide you through the history of our world. Give it a try. It might just be what you are looking for. Keep up the good work, Chris. On a side note, when reading History of Mankind, or in this case listening to it, I always find myself wondering what size the population of a certain species of mankind is at the time of reference, e.g. Australopithecus, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, etc. It would definitely give me a better appreciation of the events if I better understood the estimated size of a city, a colony, a settlement, population that migrated, etc. If you come across such information, please share on your Uh, Facebook or even consider including it in your podcast once again keep up the good work Chris yeah thanks for that feedback Um, that does always interest me I think is uh, population sizes 
Um, and it's very, very difficult to um, establish what a population size were, especially in these uh, settlements that were during this period, this Neolithic and post-Neolithic Bronze Age. Well, well we, we tend to have more writings in the Bronze Age, so we can take more educated guesses. But previous to that, it's very, very difficult, and uh, especially as scientists might cite um, things such as the Toba super eruption as something that bottlenecked the world population. But there's such arguments um, for and against these population numbers that we can only really take a, a punt or a wild guess. There's no real firm evidence of what these populations may have been. Um, and But, I mean, certainly, where I stumble across it, I do try and mention it. It's nice to try and mention it. And really, I think the most important thing was that when we were nomadic and hunter-gatherer societies, it is believed that we generally were 30 to 40 people um, within a tribe. And then uh, when we started becoming more sedentary, uh, the first villages, the first settlements might have contained up to a couple of hundred people. Once it got over a couple of hundred people, society had become much more stratified and uh, then you're sort of entering into the advanced Neolithic age where um, city-states start emerging that can actually cater for thousands of people and then during this period, I think some of these city-states that we're mentioning now we're looking at tens of thousands of people. So the, the biggest cities at the moment, we're looking at tens of thousands of people. But thanks ever so much for getting in touch, Kim. Cole Green also recommends the History of the World podcast. Cole, I think you've been following me for, for a while now, so um, I'm glad I'm continuing to keep you entertained. Uh, she writes, Thank you, Chris. Great volume one and can't wait to get stuck into volume two. Informative interesting and easy to follow keep up the great work well i'm uh, i'm really looking forward to next week actually we start looking um well i'm going to start looking more at the contemporary um story of the city of or so we're going to look back a little bit over the third millennium bce in uh, mesopotamia and look more at the Sumerian culture and how it was uh, emerging uh, through the city of Or specifically. Um, Or was so significant and there was so much going on in that city. It really does deserve its own podcast. So that's what's going to be coming up next week. And then we can follow the chronology uh, through the city of Or in actual fact um, and uh, so we'll be looking forward as well to the next period where we'll be probably looking more into uh, the emergence of Babylon but um, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself there uh, we've got a lot to get through before that thank you for listening and uh, we'll look forward to linking up again this time next week for some more History of the World podcast The History of the World podcast is hosted by Audio Boom. It is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Castbox, Podcast Republic, Stitcher, and TuneIn. You can also find it on Deezer, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. Feel free to email the show at History of the World Podcast at mail.com. Join our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter.